I did a, as I recall, a one hour interview with a journalist from Al Jazeera. Two clips of a matter of seconds were taken from the interview. I'm always cautious about, about sort of cavalier use of the term because it, it does suffer from a great deal of rather extravagant use of the term precisely because of its potential as a word to, to get people's attention. But I don't think that there's much difficulty in, in asserting that in the case of the Rohingya, that we're moving into a zone where, where the word can be used. The journalist persistently tried to get me to apply the word genocide to the situation in Myanmar at the time. My views will be a lot clearer if we could get a copy of the tape of the entire interview. Um, what we have studied is this pattern of persecution of the Rohingyas that's been going on now for decades in Burma, um, and a range of measures, including um, the um, citizenship, the, the uh, challenge or the compromise on their withdrawing their citizenship, um, all of them designed to persecute this minority, I think, with a view that they would ultimately disappear. Um, uh, but many of them, of course, have fled the country, and uh, more will continue to do so. It's an, uh, it's an inevitable consequence, in a sense, of, the, of persistent acts of persecution. And uh, beyond that, I think it is, it, it's difficult to speculate on all of the motives. Why, do, why does a majority group or why does a, 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 a regime, a, a tyrannical regime, persecute minorities? There may be complicated motivations and, and also complicated objectives. When we try to establish that crimes against humanity have been committed, we don't really need to demonstrate the motive. Of it. All that we need to show is that persecution took place against the group and that the acts of persecution were uh, intentional acts rather than accidental acts. And there's no doubt that legislation is always going to be intentional. So if the intentional, uh, uh, if the legislation has as a consequence uh, the persecution of a group, it definitely falls within the, within the uh, framework of uh, crimes against humanity. And that was that was what our report was demonstrating. Describe the kind of conditions that, as it were, what evidence was this based on? I mean, obviously, I could name them for you, but you know, forced labor and, and these kind of things. Just give a portrait of, of life there, um, arbitrary detention. You know, just give me a portrait of life there that, that your study revealed. Well, we heard uh, about a, a range of acts um, that were perpetrated against the Rohingyas. We have to bear in mind that this took place at a time when there was an extremely repressive government that was quite brutal to uh, all of the citizens. This wasn't um, a situation uh, like in South Africa, for example, where you had a, an ethnic minority that was in power and that was persecuting the majority. This was one where you had a tyrannical regime that was in effect persecuting everybody. So one of the challenges is to, to sort of untangle that so that you can see whether the, any particular group is being, uh, is being expressly targeted. And that was obvious with the Rohingyas. I think that actually the, the measures that seemed to stand out were the ones that were covered by legislation, that covered things like the withdrawal of citizenship or the uh, uh, regulations on, on marriage and prevention of marriage uh, by the group. These were the sorts of things that, um, that, that sounded alarm bells in terms of the specific targeting of the Rohingyas as opposed to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the victimization of the other populations and the, and the majority uh, 
um, in, in Burma. We certainly found evidence that uh, forced labor was, was regularly um, in part of the daily lives of, of Rohingyas. We found arbitrary detention, travel restrictions, and indeed the repeated demands for, um, for bribes. Um, these were the accounts that, that people gave. Um, all of those, I mean, would, they, would you say those are the basis of crimes against humanity? I mean, how, from a legal point of view, can those things be prosecuted? Well, crimes against humanity consists of um, a number of, of, of types of acts, including, for example, imprisonment, deportation, killing, obviously, but also um, a, a broader range of, of uh, conduct, such as what we call persecution or even uh, what's called other inhumane acts, leaving that to be determined by judges eventually. What one has to demonstrate to show that they're not just what we would call an ordinary crime, because killing, uh, kidnapping, and so on are ordinary crimes as well, is that they were conducted on a widespread and systematic basis, um, uh, and that they were an attack on a civilian population. So. Uh, one of the ways this is signaled is by the demonstration of a state policy. Some people argue that persecution of groups can take place even by, in an unofficial way, or, or by, by mafias and, and criminal type organizations. This isn't obviously our problem with the Rohingyas. We have a, a clear cut case of these acts of persecution, which were the result of the behavior of the regime, the conduct of the regime, and of its policies. So we're squarely within the frame of crimes against humanity. Who do you think could be? New field, in my view. Uh, anyway. And uh, yep. three, two, one, roll into Claude. Good. So just, you know, returning to this idea, though, of, of crimes against humanity being perpetrated. Um, there, who would be considered responsible, or who could potentially be be brought to book um, regarding these crimes in that kind of hypothetical environment? Well, because crimes against humanity is a, is a crime that is, uh, as a general principle, committed as part of a policy with a connection to a state, um, we can generally go straight up the chain and go to the leaders. Um, of course, the perpetrators of the acts on the ground, the individuals who are shedding blood, who are torturing people, they too can be held responsible, and often are. And if they come and say that they were only doing it because they were ordered to do it, we have an answer to that, which is that the, that the defense of superior orders is no defense at all. But really what we're interested in is, is going up to the higher levels and holding the people uh, at the top responsible, because they're the ones who made the policy, and they're the ones who are capable of stopping it or of changing it. And so um, there's both the blame, if you want, and the solution uh, in going for the people um, at the top. Um, and most of the international war crimes tribunals now, the International Criminal Court, the tribunals for Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, focus on the people at the top, what they sometimes call those who bear the greatest responsibility uh, for these acts. And, and so that's... Uh, that's where the burden, uh, that's where the responsibility lies in Burma, too. I don't think there's any doubt about it. In 2010, there was the election of the Rakhine Nationalities Development Party, which is uh, essentially a, it admits to being a nationalist party. Um, it does not believe that there should be um, a group called Rohingya, uh, Rohingya, Rohingya, however you pronounce it, that this group should not basically be in, in Rakhine um, state because it believes that they are not an ethnic group um, and it believes they're illegal immigrants, um, even those who perhaps have been there for generations um, and the family of their ancestors. Um, how do you, uh, I mean, where would you place that in terms of the context of international law? Uh, the, uh, the political changes in, in Burma um, over the last couple of years are, of course, in a very general sense, very, a very positive development, and they've resulted in great improvement for human rights. But they don't always improve when minorities are involved, and this is one of the difficulties. Um, there's a fascinating study someone has done called The Dark Side of Democracy, which describes how um, the persecution of minorities, leading up to genocide in the case of Nazi Germany, was part of the development of 
of modern nation states that were, as a general rule, uh, democratic, or, or maybe not as democratic as we would like to see them today, but by the standards of the time were democratic. So it's not a guarantee when, uh, when uh, there's regime change, if you want, when there are political reforms, uh, and when human rights improve for the majority, that the minorities that have been persecuted are brought along with that, because their persecution seems to derive from some other, some other cause in the, in the national psyche. I just want to go back to the question of, you know, Butidong and Mongdo provinces, um, because certainly the group called the, the, the Nasaka Border um, Security Force was established, I believe, in 1994, but it all follows on from certain documents that were brought forward by, by the Rakhine nationalists in about 1988, but effectively it kind of sealed off this area. I mean, can you put that in, in, in your words, what it, what it meant to live there? I mean, you can't certainly travel outside without a permit. People go to hospital in Bangladesh rather than in Rangoon because they can't, it's easier to cross the Nap River. But um, you know, perhaps you, if you don't mind, put it in your context. What life is like for these people there? Is it, is it an open prison, for example? I mean, it's your words I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think maybe ghetto would be an interesting way to describe it as well. It's a, it's a, uh, analogous to some of the ghettos that uh, existed for Jews in in Nazi uh, occupied Europe. Uh, it, it did have the effect of isolating of, and of, of depriving people of fundamental rights, such as the right to, to a free movement within the state, um, the right to leave the country, although people were able to get in and out um, illegally, of course, by crossing the border into, into Bangladesh. Uh, indeed, that may have been one of the things that was hoped for all along. And in the study that we did on the Rohingyas, uh, we were able, although we, we did go into Burma, we were not able to go beyond the capital, and we actually did most of our interviewing and research with the Rohingyas on the Bangladesh side of the border, because that's where they were in, in various camps and where they're, I have to say, not very happy people there either. It's not as if that's uh, a solution. It rarely is for, for people who flee persecution. Uh, some of them are fortunate enough to find a, a hospitable place of refuge, but most of them don't, and that unfortunately is the case with the Rohingyas as well. I want to turn to the question of genocide law because um, under international, under the Genocide Convention, I'm sure you're very acquainted with it, um, it talks about specific acts um, so long as there is a mental element of intent. Well, you know, there's a, certainly a body of literature that suggests that. And if you look at the first four, um, as it were, lists of specific acts, I'm sure you're aware of them, killing members of the group, causing serious body or mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the good conditions of life, calculated to bring about its physical destruction, we talked about that, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Certainly, it would seem to me that, that, that there's a case, at least, to be made, bearing in mind what we know and what, from our interviews, by the way, we've talked about all of this and forced birth, you know, the difficulty of marriage, the NASIC to go around with injections, um, you know, certainly the um, calculated to bring its physical destruction. I mean, that seems pretty true as well. I'm talking as a layman now. Hmm. So do you think that given the kind of evidence that you know and that, as I say, I've built up in parallel, do you think that there might be a case to be made that, you know, in the very restricted definition of genocide, which we know you follow, um, that there might be a case to be made here? Making a case for genocide is, of course, um, uh, quite a daunting proposition. Um, we have international law to deal with various forms of attack and oppression of, of minority groups. Uh, mostly that fits within, the, f within the, the, the definition of crimes against humanity. But I think rather occasionally, fortunately so, we encounter situations where actually the persecution goes beyond simply racist oppression but is, uh, is aimed at the extermination of the group. The destruction is the word that's used in Article 2 of the Genocide Convention. So what you're looking for is not simply that the acts themselves, such as killing, were carried out intentionally, which is not usually very difficult to establish, but that they were also uh, carried out with a, with a special or specific intent, which was to destroy the group. Now, there are different ways to destroy a group. Of course, the classic one is by physical extermination, uh, uh, gas chambers and so on, as was c carried out by the Nazis, um, or, or, or summary executions. This was what the Yugoslavia Tribunal hinged upon, 
when it pointed to the Srebrenica massacre as, a, as an act of genocide. Um, it's, it's harder to establish when we're dealing with forms of, of persecution of the group that um, don't necessarily aim in an obvious sense at the physical extermination of the group. Uh, uh, the, the, the lawyers and judges are somewhat divided on this question. We have judicial decisions that have gone in both directions. I think it would be fair to say that the majority view, that, that the majority of judges have, have gone for a narrower, more conservative approach to genocide. But that doesn't mean that uh, it's not an arguable case that genocide is taking place in a situation uh, like that confronting the Rohingyas in, in Burma. And it's also important to point out that even if we're not um, in the context of a genocide that's underway, that many of the acts that surround what's going on are warning signs of, of genocide, are, are, are precursors, if you want. And, and this has to, of course, greatly heighten our concern because, as we, we say, the famous slogan, never again, we, we live with various forms of persecution all around the world, but when it starts to get close to what looks like uh, a genocidal, um, uh, genocidal behavior, then th there, ha there has to be a more decisive response to it than, than would otherwise be the case. So uh, I think without, without answering in a, in, a, in a confirmed positive sense that this is uh, genocide, and I, I should say that I'm, I'm always cautious about, about sort of cavalier use of the term because it, it does suffer from a great deal of rather extravagant use of the term precisely because of its potential as a word to, to get people's attention. So it, it's important not to abuse the term and not to use it unnecessarily. But the, I don't think that there's much difficulty in, in asserting that in the case of the Rohingya that we're moving into a... We're moving into a zone where, where the word can, can be used, um, even if it's, it's certainly, uh, we have insufficient evidence now to reach any firm conclusion. Because certainly, I mean, there's a history to this. For, for many years, really, from the, from the time of the end of the Second World War, when the Genocide Convention was adopted, it was really the only effective legal tool we had to deal with atrocities. Um, the, the notion of crimes against humanity had, in a sense, been, been sterilized or maybe immunized at, at Nuremberg because the powers that set up the Nuremberg Tribunal, the four victorious powers, were cautious because they felt that if they were to give too broad a, a notion of crimes against humanity, it might apply to stuff they were doing as well in their colonies and elsewhere. And so what emerged from that period in the 1940s was a quite a robust concept of genocide and, and a, a sterile one of crimes against humanity. So genocide then, for the next 40 or 50 years, was, was really the, the only real tool you had to throw at an atrocity in terms of, of legal criminal liability on the individual basis. That starts to change in the 1990s, and the, really the, the big story in the last decade or two is that crimes against humanity has opened up and become far more effective for dealing with atrocities at, at various levels. So the significance now of establishing something as genocide as opposed to a crime against humanity is not nearly as great as it once was. And uh, it, it's more symbolic now. It's a, it's a word that, that still resonates, that is very effective for advocacy um, if, if you can demonstrate that, that you're in the context where genocide is taking place. And of course, it's also one that's subject to a great deal of abuse because it's used to, to describe all forms of, of, of violence. Um, and it, probably as a, as a general proposition, I think we're, we're on more secure ground. We're always on more secure ground demonstrating that something is a crime against humanity than genocide. And the legal consequences of, of doing that now are, are, are tiny. There's really very little advantage in a legal sense of ratcheting up the description of an atrocity so that you can call it genocide rather than crimes against humanity. It was once of great legal significance. It no longer is. It still, though, has a, a, a semantic importance. Well, I mean, just on, finally on this, I mean, it's, it's, it's perhaps just the, the, the kind of 
whiffs of, of, of what's going on in um, Rakhine State, where it is imposing measures intending to prevent births, where it's kind of inflicting on the group conditions of life, that and, and the kind of intent to eliminate them by denying their existence. I mean, perhaps the total number of killings is not in, in the numbers that you see now, anywhere near the numbers that we see in some of the other places, but there's that whiff to it. I mean, that's my point. Is that fair? Yes, I think it is fair. Uh, one of the things that there, it, when I say that the definition of genocide is is without the, the great, it doesn't have the same legal significance that it once did in terms of distinguishing it from crimes against humanity. It nevertheless is described as the, the apex crime. It's the crime of crimes. And I think for very good and understandable reasons because it targets people based on race and on ethnicity and uh, contemplates their destruction. And I think that's a very, um, it's very, it should be very easy to understand why that makes it the crime of crime because of the its profoundly racist nature. What we have with the Rohingyas in Burma are some of the warning signs that indicate the kind of mentality that ultimately degenerates into, a, or, or, or accelerates, if you want, uh, into a, a truly genocidal paradigm. And so it would be a place of a special concern. We can't say that about all forms of persecution of minorities because we have them all over the world in one form or another. Uh, and many, many states uh, are responsible for different degrees and different levels, obviously, but persecution of minorities, um, uh, of discrimination. And, and this doesn't mean automatically that we're talking about genocide. And it's, it's premature to start even you know, waving the, the, the danger sign saying this could ultimately degenerate into genocide. But when you see measures preventing births, trying to deny the identity of a people, uh, hoping to see that they really are eventually, that they no longer exist, denying their, uh, denying their history, denying the legitimacy of their right to live where they live. These are all warning signs that, that, that mean that it's not, it's not frivolous and it's not uh, uh, to, 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 to start to, to, to envisage the use of the term genocide.